where it's always the opportunity to have a lot of people who are not very expert in the area um, wax eloquently about what they, what they know. Uh, no, we, we do have an esteemed panel. The way I'd like to run this is to introduce my host speakers. Um, they're going to say a number of words on particular issues and <laughs> particular topics. And then we're going to open it up for discussion so you can interact with us if you'd like to do that. Um, so I might start with the introductions. Well, there's Amanda. I thought you might have run away. <laughs> um, the constitution of this panel is that you've got 50% of the Dean's Learning and Teaching at Griffith <laughs> University with Laurel and I. And then you've got two uh, nationally recognised discipline experts. Um, uh, with my other colleagues and so I'll just do some quick introductions. Uh, Lorelle is the Dean Learning and Teaching for the Griffin, Griffith Business School um, and she's also the Director of the Asia Pacific Centre for Franchising Excellence. And both Lorelle and I have uh, funded a number of things within the intercultural competence area. Uh, on the end there is Amanda Henderson, Professor Amanda Henderson. She's a clinical academic title holder at Griffith University and also the Nursing Director of Education at the Princess Alexandra Hospital, which is uh, nearly our largest hospital in Queensland, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Amanda? It's the Gold Coast Hospital. Mm. <laughs> and finally, we've got Professor Stephen Biller, who's a Professor of Adult and Vocational Education. Um, he was an ALTC National Teaching Fellow and has now managed to avoid teaching again by going on <laughs> being, being an ARC future fellow. Uh, Stephen's been a, a nationally and internationally recognised discipline scholar uh, for a number of years and uh, is regularly invited to give presentations here in Australia and overseas. I'm going to make a couple of comments and then my colleagues will then follow. Um, I figure from a Dean's point of view, uh, it's important I think that I at least say a couple of strategic things um, in terms of my role. And I think what was interesting for me was something that Betty said at the, in her presentation about the need to, the need to mainstream <coughs> intercultural competence uh, in all segments of the university. And one of my colleagues who's just gone had a great idea for a project uh, that she's come to me and say. And the first thing she said to me which is interesting, is this dream that I have is cost neutral. <laughs> which is, of course, always the words I think they expect things to hear. <laughs> um, I'll probably be having cost neutral dreams tonight, <laughs> whatever they are. Um, and I think what this connects into is that really universities often have two types of agendas. The first agendas are the real agendas, and they're the things that they're really prepared to fund and resource. And some of those you'll identify quite readily for those who are at universities. And these are things about retention, uh, about improving the quality of teaching, about meeting TEXA requirements, and, and things like program evaluation. And then there's those imperatives that I call the rhetorical agendas, which are those that all universities state they do. And they often state them from a marketing perspective, but they don't actually put a lot of money into them. Um, and they don't actually resource them quite that well. And I have to say, and I think intercultural competence has fallen into that category. So it's a matter of how we shift it from the rhetoric into the reality. And I think that the key to it is what Betty was saying about how we mainstream it. And so I think one of the things that's come out for me today is that, that as a transition strategy, we really need to connect the intercultural competence agenda to some of these real agendas that the university decides on in terms of resourcing. So from my point of view, we're about to start work on a large project and project evaluation, uh, program evaluation in the university. Um, one of the things we should be doing in program evaluation is making it explicit that intercultural competence is something that should be included within the curriculum and so that our five-year program reviews that we had at Griffin explicitly look at that issue in terms of program evaluation. So that's what I mean about connecting it to those agendas to make sure we can start to mainstream it. The other thing that I'd like to say is that I know from talking to academics 
that they're already doing quite a number of things in the classroom which could be defined as promoting intercultural competence, but they don't define it like that. And I think we need to make the implicit more explicit, and we need us to assist academics to do that. Um, I think that part of the research recommendation I would have is that we need to bring those activities that academics are doing uh, more forward, make them more explicit, so that academics can see that this is accessible. And Michelle gave a really good example about using the alliance building tool, uh, which is a really simple tool to um, have a, a good intercultural competence activity in the classroom. And I think we need to look at how then we represent the activities that a lot of academics are doing already in that space, make it explicit so they can see that this agenda is accessible and that it doesn't take a huge amount of additional effort on their part in terms of embedding in the curriculum. So there are my two observations. I'll leave it there. I might pass it on to Stephen next. Notice that Nick's cheating. He has notes here. <laughs> 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 um, this morning I was at a, a TAFE college not far away from here, um, Mount Cravat College in TAFE. I used to teach there about 25 years ago. And at that time, the big cultural differences, as I recall, were between the fashion students I used to teach, who used to dress in particular ways, and the engineering students were largely male, and the business studies students who were um, um, largely female. And they used to give the fashion students a hard time over the way they, that they were dressed. Today I was surprised when I was there to see the diversity of, um, um, of, of cultures and folks over there that were quite different from my experience. My daughter would tell you that she's not talking to me at the moment. Um, <laughs> my daughter would tell you that the school, the high school she goes to, has 96 nationalities represented in the centre of Brisbane. So I think this issue is not one which is, is boutique. Um, it's one which is obviously across the three educational sectors. Mm. I guess from a learning perspective, one of the issues with um, cultural practices and um, learning about them is that they're difficult to recognise. It wasn't Orsabelle, but it was somebody of that era, a cognitivist, who made an observation that the kinds of learning that are quite novel are very difficult to, to see because you you don't perceive them, that they're outside of your, your frame of reference. So the Australian nurse who goes to work in New Zealand, in a New Zealand hospital, might see, for instance, that there are different coloured pillows around the place, but may not know that some of the pillows are supposed to be for the feet only, and some are supposed to be for the head, because of the cultural practices that come from Polynesia. I remember when um, I go to work at a university in Shanghai, the East China University, and a graduate student, a female, young female graduate student, was escorting me around and taking me um, for a trip. And we left the campus, and as soon as we left the campus, she slipped her arm like this. And I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. I wasn't quite sure how to respond to that. <laughs> and we were walking along, and I was thinking this through, this is unusual. And then what I saw way in the distance was a very um, similarly aged, or perhaps younger, uh, Chinese woman doing something similar with her father. And what I realized that what she was communicating to the world was that this was a familial relationship, and not a kind of sexual relationship or something <laughs> like this. So she was doing that. But had I not seen this other couple doing this, I would probably. So that suggests, I think, to me that there are some kinds of um, 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 learnings which come from engaging in different cultural contexts which require to be made explicit, particularly if the cues and cues are not there to help us realize. And I think the idea that um, in the presentation about students going to, to Laos, for instance, introducing some of those things which might not be discovered by simply simple observation. But I also think within that, there's part of that preparation, which I think is really great what was being discussed, is preparing the students to be very active learners um, in making sense of things. 
but one thing I do when I travel um, in other places on public transport, I always find myself near the, the exit from the train or the bus or something, because there's so many different ways of getting out of trains and buses. So I always try to position myself so that someone can see something. Is it one of those the doors are open automatically, or do you have to press something? And you don't press the red thing here because that causes real problems. And then of course, then of course you find yourself in your hotel room on your own, trying to work how the shower works. And there seems to be so many complications. And so that for me are two very different situations. One where you've got lots of models and lots of cues and cues, how to get out of how the door operates. And then you find yourself marooned in your hotel room where um, you're trying to work out how to make the faucet work properly. So I think there's um, realizing that some things will be learned easily and some other things will require explicit interventions to help people understand the life to be important. So something I'd like to say, if there's time later, um, a big issue, I think it's, it's a very big issue, about um, academic writing and intercultural issues. But I'll leave that at this time for that for later. Thanks, Steve. Lorraine. Thank you. First of all, I'd just like to congratulate everyone who's been involved with this project because it's, it's been a marvellous day to sit here and listen to what you've been doing. So congratulations to uh, the project leaders and the teams and all the academics who've been involved and uh, tried out these, uh, experimenting with some of these things and uh, showing us today because it's been really enlightening for us. Nick is uh, Dean's Learning Teaching in particular to be able to, to see what's happening in the group. So well done, I think it's been, yeah, it's been fabulous. <laughs> so last night I had to go and babysit the next door neighbour's kid. So <laughs> I put her to bed. And then I had to watch Break on TV. This is the last episode. I'm, I'm depressed. <laughs> but anyway, so that it was like 9.30 and I thought, oh, Michelle's going to be counting on me tomorrow. So I got out the iPad and I thought, I'll look up the group of attributes because for sure, you know, we know there's a diversity one, cultural diversity one there. And I could remember that and I could remember the, the <coughs> communication one. I thought, what? What were the other ones like? <laughs> and see, even now I need my notes. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, and this is it's funny when Al said it's a viral infection. This <laughs> 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 is so bland, really. But all of them um, really, they don't stand alone. And you know, to be um, culturally competent is really part of all of Griffith attributes mm -hmm. because they're about knowledge and skills in the discipline, about communication. Uh, critical judgment, socially responsible, um, and then the diverse international environments. So you can't really just separate them. So the thing is, they're all intertwined and we are doing them all the time, or should be. Um, Alf also mentioned um, how when you're in the dominant group, there's this blindness that can occur <coughs> and uh, you won't necessarily have those intercultural sensitivities. Um, it's interesting because in the group of business school, 48% of our students are international students. So in a sense, we're even um, with international and domestic students, and yet that kind of cultural blindness can still occur. <coughs> um, and here I was thinking, oh, I'm quite smug. Um, we're in the group of business school. We've, we've done a lot of this stuff because we've got double ACSB accreditation. We've gone through at the program level. We've got this ticked off. Um, so I'm still sitting there with my iPad last night, babysitting the kid, and <coughs> decided to have a look at our curriculum maps just to revise that for me because we would have had this as one of our program learning goals in all of our programs. And I was absolutely gobsmacked back to find that um, we just sort of throw the word global in here and there, or <laughs> international, and there wasn't really um, an objective around this that was as Nick said, explicit, it was implicit. Um, for instance, the Master of Marketing, we said, advanced critical thinking and deep knowledge in the global marketing do domain. And that was it, that one word for the whole program. And I said, oh, well, I'll go to the Master of International Business, that'll be full of it. And we had the word international a few times, but when I looked at communication, written and oral communication, there was no mention of the global context or 
intercultural competencies. So it doesn't mean that we're not doing it uh, at all, but I think we do probably need to be more explicit about it if this is something that you know we're championing. Um, but I think we're probably nailing it more at the course level because this is what we've seen today. Examples of people showing us things that they're doing in their courses. Um, Peter, your course, Management Concepts, the largest course in the university. Yeah. Uh, it is a big course. <laughs> um, and of course, in business school, nearly every student gets to take that course. I think the only ones who don't do that would be the government and politics students. The international business students. The international business students that they do. So, but the danger, of course, when you have a course like that that is common is that it gets used for everything. And um, Peter would know he's, he's had to embed other things into the course, careers education, ethics education. And Peter, I haven't told you about the latest one. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. Studying smarts will be coming your way. <laughs> but, I'm going um, on study leave. <laughs> And it made me think, you know, this is really bad because um, you're, you're trying to do great things in your, in your course and we keep, you know, telling you what to put in there and you're trying to cram it in. But on the other hand, the great thing is that so many of our students have been exposed to it in first year business and then they're picking up in Marta's course, for instance, in other people's courses in second and third year, um, the skills. So um, it was great to see those videos today, Michelle. Um, and we're very happy in the business field to be funding those extra resources. Um, and I think you'd all realise too, just looking at them, wasn't it? It was easier to model behaviour when you can see it. So I think that that'll be a great resource for students as well as all the things that you're doing in the classes. For our future plans, we'd also like to look at modelling those sorts of behaviours um, in workplace settings, so rather than classroom settings. Um, similar to what you're doing in health with clinical settings, but for us, workplace settings. Um, and certainly one of the aims that I'd like to look at and talk to um, Michelle and Peter about in the business school is greater capacity building for our staff so that we can raise awareness and uh, get this happening. It was really pleasing to hear Michelle say that even if you're just saying something in your classroom like, how does that happen in your culture? You're doing it. And of course people are. We need to be reminded of that. But um, I think we can build on that and um, it will grow from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 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 Well, I'd like to um, thank Michelle and certainly all the presenters because I was, uh, really enjoyed the presentation that um, I heard today and I've certainly learned a lot more um, in relation to intercultural and internationalisation. Um, I'd first like to pick up Nick's, Nick's point about um, embedding it. I was really impressed with the concept of the cultural map. I think what came out for me was its applicability. It wasn't just for the, uh, when you have international <coughs> students in your area. I think the uh, last experience was wonderful about domestic students going to another culture. Uh, part of um, my interest is work integrated learning and as part of an ARC discovery project and I was doing some research for, uh, for it this week and I was actually in the clinical area in one of the uh, wards at uh, PA and I was observing teaching practices and I was observing an Indian registered nurse interacting with a third year Griffith Korean nurse. And um, it just, as I was sitting here today, I just sort of thought that cultural map, because at the end of the two hour observation, I then uh, interviewed both those particular staff members. And I felt how useful having a map in around some of the uh, assumptions and some of the uh, uh, dialogue that could have occurred before the two started that shift actually could have facilitated the degree of learning that occurred during that shift. So what really came out for me was the applicability that as a, as a map it can be used to almost deconstruct many aspects, not in, just not even specifically for intercultural but certainly acknowledging the intercultural but whether it's a management experience or a learning experience or um, whatever we're doing in our practice. So um, Michelle, I just think it's a, it's, it's a great tool that just has very widespread applicability. 
I'd certainly um, uh, take the point about the workplace because as I was sitting there, I thought we're trying to teach these students. There's a lot that we can actually do to teach the teachers in the workplace that are interacting with the students and to find some avenues and certainly with the university, Nick, I'm aware that they're always trying to engage with workplaces. So to find some mechanisms where they can engage with workplaces where these students are receive so much of their or so much of the experience, the workplace experience as part of their learning, that they can actually be subject to positive experiences in this area rather than we constantly hear of the sort of not so positive experiences. Um, I felt that uh, the greater applicability of this could uh, really go a long way. Um, just one final point, just in relation to the, because uh, I'm aware that many of you are saying, oh, you'd like to take this into a research perspective and seeing benefits. I'm the young, and I, it was nice, um, Peter, with some of the graphs around intercultural competence. I actually feel that there's some avenue where the benefits of that whole intercultural competence um, could really be explored as actually having some tangible outcome like retention in the workplace, higher productivity, um, and really exploring to see, to, to try and sell it from some sort of applicability, to try and draw some stronger parallels because it was excellent work that was being done, stronger parallels to some real tangibles that could then sort of help sell itself. And that would probably be my recommendation because I um, certainly uh, feel that there's immense value in it all. Thanks very much, Amanda. Um, that was a diversity of views on, the, on topics to do with intercultural competence. What we might do now is open it up to you as the audience to pick up on any points that we've raised or points that you'd like to make in addition. Does anybody like to... We stunned you with our erudite views. <laughs> Peter, and then, yeah. I was just going to say one of the challenges, uh, and I've heard this repeated a number of times, therefore, is to train the staff effectively mm -hmm. in this whole process. And um, uh, it'd be great if that could happen more at the uh, faculty or even the university level um, to uh, introduce it in a more widespread way, uh, knowing that the Excel training is one perhaps avenue, but um, uh, you know, even other adaptable courses that could be used throughout the university could possibly help to uh, make it more of a real graduate attribute that's uh, implemented in a number of places. Peter, what would your suggestion be for attracting, you know, often with training you get the converter coming along, how do you attract? I think uh, those courses particularly that are experimenting with embedding, the ones that we've spoken about today, because I can think of my management concepts tutors yeah. who would uh, really benefit from coming along, so um, you could of course, the tailor-made process is the uh, easiest way to get people to buy in, but um, where there is an intention to embed, um, and we, we have these learning circles that are established um, that would uh, perhaps be the core group to get things going. Thanks, Peter. Another question here. Ryan, after you, Ryan. I would simply interested in the comment about um, academic writing. Well, I'm, uh, I'm not sure how relevant this is today's um, conversation, but um, <coughs> I, I edit uh, a journal, which is a social science cited in the journal, uh, a book series, more so an international handbook. And a problem I'm come, trying to come to grips with is that academics across the world are now having to write in English. In Joss's country, for instance, um, academics only get um, only get rewards for articles which are in um, top tier journals such as social science indexes journals. And there's a couple of things going on which I think are really problematic. One is that um, good academics, experienced academics from a range of cultures who don't speak English and can't write English, the senior ones, the ones who've got great um, capital, are not able to articulate their ideas in the journals which they're being directed to, to publishing. And as such, their work is not being made available to um, in English, which is a problem. But that's reinforced by a younger generation of researchers who abandon the cultural um, ideas from their own heritage 
and instead um, co-opt concepts from the United Kingdom, Britain, Australia. So that they don't draw upon their own heritage, they draw elsewhere uh, from other, other heritage. And what we're seeing, I think, I think it's highly problematic, is a concentration of concepts uh, associated with things that, you know, the sort of things I look at how people learn, that only come from the English-speaking world and are driven by academics. And in my own field, there's, you know, it's almost come down to about eight or nine key institutions. And this was really brought to, to me very strongly recently when I was um, part of a, a meeting in Geneva where a group of French-speaking academics came together to talk about the thing I'm interested in, how people learn through practice. And they have a French tradition called ergonomique, which is about this thing, about how people work and how their bodies engage and how they learn. And that is totally outside of um, the discourse which I've been looking at for the last 20 years. And I was astonished, A, that this exists and I didn't know about it. But most of those academics would have great difficulty because of their traditions in actually um, expressing their ideas <coughs> cogently in English in ways which would get into top tier journals. So for me, there's a real problem. Um, a, an experienced generation of academics with very good ideas who are not able to express themselves in English. And then a younger generation who are seeking to make their mark and their march through engaging with ideas from the Britain and America. And so what the great danger is that cultural traditions from Germany, um, uh, less so than Finland, I think, less so than Netherlands, I might have, but from the French-speaking world, Spanish-speaking world, uh, Portuguese-speaking world, are probably <coughs> being lost. And so we're moving to a concentration of ideas that come from those who can articulate their ideas well in English. I see that's being a, a, a big issue. Can I make a comment on that? You prefaced your remarks and saying you're not sure how relevant they are, but I actually thought you were going to talk about um, students' academic writing. Um, and, and I can see the direct parallel. Yeah, and the question yes. I think we have for us is having just marked a bunch of essays in an international business class that had one Australian in it out of 27, um, at least one person born in Australia out of 27, um, was that we're, in, you could argue, imposing assessment methods. Mm. that are from our tradition mm. yeah. and yet we're at the same time advocating mm. this mm. cultural sensitivity. And I think your comments are really interesting mm. in that perspective as well mm. thinking from the students. So thank you. Does anybody else want to pick up on that theme while we're I think it's a really, really important issue. And I, I'm, I was just reminded of a discussion I had with a Chinese or um, uh, an academic in the social sciences, Chinese born, man <coughs> living in and working in Singapore, who was on a panel at an international conference and was asked what he thought internationalisation of the curriculum might be in the future, might be that notion of imagining what it might look like. And he said, I feel I'm in a very privileged position because in the social sciences there's a lot of really interesting stuff that is published in Mandarin. I can read that mm -hmm. and I can incorporate those ideas into my writing and I can write about that in English or I can write about it in Mandarin. But there's a whole lot of you out there who don't, who will never get that unless you learn Mandarin. So who's the problem? Is it, you know, it, it's about, it's our problem actually that we don't speak these languages and in Australia I think we have a very, uh, closed view about involving ourselves with academic discourses. And I think this goes back also to that point that I made earlier in my in the graph around the dominant paradigm mm -hmm. and English language fits into that internationalisation sphere. In there, in terms of what, what Stephen's been talking about, but also in the knowledges that we privilege in our own thinking and our ability to actually, so this is a really complex, deep issue that's a really good one to, to really chew over and dream about, or maybe it's a nightmare. It's, it's an interesting thing, and it hasn't really been looked at a whole lot, like <coughs> in Australia, that particular issue. 
But you know, now that you've said that, I mean, I work with people from Peking University, and they collect a lot of data and we work together. But really, they see it as our job to write the article up in English using you know, theories and models from the Western literature. Uh, I wonder how that. Uh, uh, they're pleased to get it published because they need it, as you say. But I think we are missing out on. Um, I have a Just from, we've implemented intercultural into Open Universities Australia, and in comparison, because I've also tutored with Marta in the face to face course. And I think one of the challenges that we have in Open Universities Australia is that you have an online audience. And one of the beauties about the face-to-face -face course is that, as Marsh was saying earlier, the students, while they're actually doing the case, they're having to participate in a group that is already multicultural. How do we replicate that experience in an online setting? So it's coming down to, we haven't done that yet. So they do a solo analysis of the case and they do a solo implementation of Excel and taking that to the next level for the open university level. Do you think you can do that? I think there are ways, I mean there are ways to involve groups online, a little bit more complex because there's a higher drop off rate uh, with OUA students. It's also a little bit harder because um, you know they're not together, so you can create wikis. There has been a, you know, hiccups with wikis in terms of technology, so I think that the, the advancement of technology is still progressing and down the line that will provide solutions that will come out. We're looking forward to the new version of Blackboard 9.1. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll have to come and collaborate for all the... Oh, oh, so cool I'll just pick up on Ray and then... Oh, Ray, you've been waiting patiently. Uh, uh, something that I'd like to take up with, uh, I think a couple of the panel members mentioned, um, there's an issue of will and, and international students. Uh, earlier this year, the cultural diversity and internationalisation community of practice conducted a symposium on will international students and employers and we had a panel of employers of alumni and academics and it was very interesting to well, one way I have to describe it I suppose was to see the students and, and the employers having a what looked like what Mannheim calls total ideologies that just that argued past each other, but, but rarely ever met on a common on common ground. And it seemed to me that the, there was a big issue about not only the preparation of staff uh, to deal with issues around will and in, and and, uh, and international students, but there's also a, a real need for the prepara preparation of employers. And I wondered whether anyone on the panel has got some ideas about how that might be done. I mean, there's an interface here. There's an interface between the university, employers, and students. And, uh, and yes, are there any ideas about the preparation of people out there who will want to take on our students? Because at the moment, many of them don't want to take on it international students, they immediately put up the walls and say they can't communicate appropriately, we don't want them. Thanks, Ray. It's very difficult. Um, and uh, but the funny thing is that uh, you know, I've been working with getting advice from employers for um, about a quarter of a century, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask because it depends what day it is and um, um, you know, uh, what their needs are. If their needs are there, they'll be happy to communicate. If there's a shortage of nurses, they will be happy to engage with folk whose English isn't crisp or cultural practices aren't the same or whatever. So if that comes and goes, it's quite difficult. But I think, it, it, in fact, at the moment, I think we decided some time ago that um, it's best to invest in two areas, our practices as educators, but also students, how we can prepare students and negotiate that stuff. Because my experience has been that I've, over the years, done work in workplaces, trying to do things to prepare people for various different things. And then those people move on to different roles or they move on. And you can 
use up an awful lot of good investment and time and effort and get little results over the long term. Hence, some of the work I do now is about trying to empower students to use that language to be active learners, to be agentic learners, to help things for themselves. That's not addressing your question. But a couple of ways of, um, there's one way I saw that where this, where decent efforts went wrong. And that was, uh, and this is not answering your question, but just to you know, emphasize the problem you're addressing, that is, one university I was in with a work integrated learning project was in the field of IT. And the local employers didn't want to give, um, their, you know, computer employers didn't want to give the international students work experience because they were using this to, to test the students as being potential employees. And so the domestic students went off to these high-end computer companies and learned all about you know, the latest software or whatever where it is. And the university did, thought it was doing the right thing and found other kinds of placements for the international students. They found them placements in not-for-profit organizations and schools and places like that, where they were doing things like replacing print printer cartridges and fixing up um, mice that <coughs> school students had pinched the ball out of and things like that. But when you stand back and look at the experiences and compare, contrast the experiences that the two groups of students had, you would conclude that the domestic students were engaged in high-end work experience with high-end employers were doing far, far better than those um, um, in, who were just doing sort of their more routine tasks. Oftentimes you can't get around that, but I think there's things that we can do as educators, which is to share those experiences wherever possible. I don't think the IT is the best one, but to try and engage students who have good, different kinds of experiences to share them across, to try and broaden it, it, their experiences of those different kinds of experiences for lots of reasons. But I think the problem you're dealing with um, is entrenched. Um, out of the National Teaching Fellowship I was involved in, with what we identified was that, uh, said this on a number of occasions now, that our students are not um, time poor, they're time jealous. We know the teachers are also time jealous, but also what came through in that study was that many of the workplaces are resource jealous. They don't have the resources to provide all these experiences. So I think we need to think imaginatively about the kind of pedagogic practices that we can engage in, for instance, to share students' experiences. Now, I'll give you an example, and I don't want to take too much time, of one of the projects that came at the National Teaching Fellowship. This was in the area of chiropractic work, and it was from Murdoch University. And the chiropractic students at Murdoch um, go each year to a, um, a stateless community in northern India and provide chiropractic care for. The students actually raise money for the community, not to pay for the, to, for the community, and they pay for their own airfares and they sleep rough. And they provide this um, um, support in this community for periods of two weeks. And they then came back, and part of this work integrated learning thing was for them to report to other students about what they'd done. And this group of students had gone there, done this good work, and came back, and were reporting to the other students. But there's a big cultural divide in chiropractic work. One is that it's an intervention when people have got problems. And in this community, the community gets by, by the way, by breaking rocks. Children break rocks, adults break rocks, older folks break rocks to make a quid, to make them, to live. Um, and so there's two, two philosophies within um, chiropractic work. One is, as said, that you have an intervention with somebody who's hurt from breaking rocks. The other philosophy is that chiropractic is about continuous care. So when these students came back, feeling they'd done the right thing, raised money, given their time, supported this community for a period of two weeks, they're immediately confronted by their peers who said, what you've done is outrageous. What you've done is irresponsible because chiropractic work is about continuous care. And so this led to an interesting interaction which was very fundamental to what chiropractic work was. Now, that I think was using a situation which not all of them were involved in, only a small number involved in, to really explore at great depth these contrasting philosophies of chiropractic work. The nice outcome of the story was, by the way, that um, the students at this university then contacted students who were doing chiropractic work across 
at Australian universities and New Zealand universities, and now what they're providing for is continuity of care in this community um, in, in northern India. But that's it, I think it's an example of where only a small number of the students have this really high-end experience of a different kind that one was talking about, but it was used effectively to address some very, very fundamental issues within um, their occupation and how they could transact across those different views. Yeah. Um, I'll tie a few points together because it's sort of, I was going to just tag on to what Agata was saying about the difference between students trying to learn these things online as individuals as opposed to face to face where we can get them to work a little more intensively in groups. And we do see some of the students online who have, for instance, there, there are some of our students who are expatriates actually working overseas, okay? And so they look at a cultural map in the, in the case study and they're like, bing clicks right together. They've got the experiential capital to, to make that make sense for them right now, where other students, we've got a big range of students who don't get it. We don't have the intervention of putting them in a group to sort of level out that experiential capital between them. And then the other thing is the employers probably what they're doing is they're generalizing about the experiential capital of domestic students versus um, international students in expressing their, their demand to take them on for placement. So, so in some ways, the strategies, and as, as Stephen was saying, it's about how we actually get that experiential capital both spread around and synergized together so that it becomes richer for all of the students. Okay, um, I'll just wondering, um, you know, we have a Um, but there's no sustainability. Say we teach our students about intercultural communication. <coughs> Excuse me. We get the facilitators and we give them workshops. But they do work with a lot of other staff there. So what it is is that it's a cultural clash in itself because these people are not aware of this or they don't have time. So do you have any this how? Because we work as partners a lot of the time in the clinical area as well as in the university sector, how we can work together to sustain that so that it will be slowly developed because in a neutral cost rate or something. I really don't know. Um, is it maybe an induction program or something? Do you know what we can do? I think this, this is uh, solved overnight, but I just think yeah. you need a, a multi-pronged approach. I think one, certainly the students with their skills that they're equipped with will um, assist with that, essentially what Stephen was alluding to with you know, workplace changes. I actually think that uh, because you, you do have um, facilitators that work out in the hospitals, but in effect it's the registered nursing workforce that works with your students. And so I think you could broaden a lot of that education um, so that it's you're extending it further because a lot of it is about entrenching practices. I know you want to embed it at the university, but once these are practices that should be embedded in good workplace practices, and so. I actually think that you will find that once it starts to change, and I think, Betty, I liked your comment this morning about you had these people who wanted to get from here to over here, that um, you weren't going to, it was going to take stages. And I actually think that's the approach you use where you have students, you have the, the, the nurses that are assessing them, but then the nurses that are working with them, and then it's, it, it's a slow process where you then sort of gradually influence. But I think that the merit is in the utility of it um, because I think people will. I like your idea of experiential um, capital because these people are, I know one nurse unit manager said to me, I've got a, you know, a Korean, a Chinese, a Japanese, a Brazilian and a French and she said, and it's the Chinese and the Japanese that are fighting, spending most of the time fighting. So you've got these um, um, immensely, immensely um, culturally diverse communities that I think would really um, welcome um, th these sort of um, opportunities to um, assist with their work workplace practices. Mm -hmm. One more point and then we might have to wind it up. Um, just back to the question about employers and their acceptance. The students are new to working at Griffith, so a lot of money to give back. Um, from the point of view of an employer who's trying to recruit students before and now from the point of view of the university trying to um, send students out to an employer, since this word Griffith comes into it again, what an amazing thing if we can say Griffith students come having done this and been exposed to this and this is what that looks like, Mr. and Mrs. <coughs> Mr. 
so that the employer's expectations are managed from the start, they're meeting expectations, the student is told that they are going out representing the university as having undertaken that. I, I think there's certainly scope that if it's spelt out in very plain language and you treat student placement like any other good HR practice, that there's ways to really make it understood. Okay, uh, thank you for your contribution. That was excellent. It was a good discussion there. A lot of issues were raised, and we're fortunate to have Ross with us because he's going to provide us with answers to all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks very much. Yeah. You might have a couple. Yeah, can we take the panel? Oh.